Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 78, recorded on July 8th, 2020. Honey, I built an app. Hey, Jonathan. How's it going? Good, Justin. How are you? No, I'm doing fine. You know, it's an early day. Uh, it's midweek of a short week. Uh, I, I enjoy it. How about you, Ryan? How are you doing? I am doing well. Thank you. Uh, Peter continues to be time zone challenged and uh, is not here. So we've uh, called his one of his architects, uh, which is Matt Cohn, who's been on the show before. Hey, Matt. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Good. And uh, this is actually a fantastic opportunity because we talked about something a couple episodes ago where uh, Google had proposed that there's a common question that you should ask all of your cloud architects. Now, my cloud architects are here on the phone with us because uh, Jonathan and Ryan are basically my cloud architects. And so they they had never been asked this question. And so we told Peter that he had to go and ask you this question. Uh, so we are here now with you live to ask you the question. All right. The Google pose and says it's the most, one of the most important Google questions uh, you should ask. And so Matt, how quickly can we exchange a request and a response between two endpoints in the cloud? Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so since you haven't listened to that episode yet, they then go on to a very long blog post where they tell us all about how to use ping and traceroute and other uh, iperf type tools to basically determine that Google's cloud network is the fastest and the best you should use theirs. Uh, but they did pose in the very first opening paragraph of that blog post that uh, every cloud architect should be answering that question. And so we challenged Jonathan and Ryan, and they had, they had no idea either. We had a so, resounding dirt. <laughs> So, so you are right on par on course with that. So, you know, it's nothing, nothing against you personally, but uh, it's just a little bit fun. Perfect. I'm yeah. okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but so apparently uh, you may be asked by a client in the future, uh, just how quickly you can exchange a request and a response uh, between two endpoints in the cloud. So you should be prepared for this answer in the future. What is the official answer? Well, they give oh. you all the tooling to figure out how to answer that question. Uh, oh, so there's not actually an answer. It's no, the no. long story about how you should answer, how, Correct, how you would yeah. get the information. But if you're yeah, a cloud okay. architect, you should have the solution at hand because, you know, this is a question that people should be asking all their cloud architects. How fast can you deliver between two endpoints? Which I challenge. It's like, that's not all that useful at all. <laughs> no. I, I now have a new interview question. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But uh, it is interesting because the... You know, the, the fact that they, they recommended a bunch of tools, but the one tool they recommended, of course, is a Google custom tool <laughs> or a custom configuration of a tool that Google suggests that, you know, makes Google look really, really great, which is kind of funny. Uh, we talked about it here on the show. But, uh, yeah, so definitely check that out in uh, 76 uh, because we, we talked about it here on the show. And uh, we, we thought we'd send Peter off to go ask, ask you the question, and he failed us on 77. So now we brought you here on 78 to ask you directly. I'm okay with that. Yeah, that's so good. Well, let's move on to more exciting news than uh, Google's silly blog post. Uh, the no-code solution is finally here, guys. Amazon has delivered to us the long-hyped and much-awaited no-code solution, and it's called Amazon Honeycode. And no, that's not a joke. <laughs> that's actually the name. Now, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm a little confused about a no-code solution with code in the name. Uh, I'm also a little bit confused why they used Honey as a... Many, many women probably don't like to be called honey, and that might not be necessarily the best choice of names, but they're sort of implying that maybe women can't code, which I don't think they meant to, but that's how it feels, and that's a little rough. Uh, but this product is a beta release. Uh, this new fully managed Amazon service gives you the power to build powerful mobile and web applications without writing any code. Uh, it leverages a familiar spreadsheet model and lets you get started in just a few minutes. Uh, you can either start with a blank sheet, or you can use some of the samples, including a to-do app customer tracker, simple survey, inventory management, etc. cetera. Uh, all the documentation is, of course, in the form of a community website and wiki structure, uh, which is different than all the other documentation. It's also very disconnected from the Amazon console experience. It's its own UI and interface and logins. Uh, and it only has two APIs, which is a little interesting, a get screen data and an invoke screen automation. Uh, so I thought, you know, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to create a CloudPod web app, uh, you know, for mobile, because that's what Ryan and I said we we're going to do with Xcode someday, and that's never going to happen because I know both of us are too busy. So I thought, well, maybe Honeycode would be the solution to that. And uh, I very quickly realized there's no way to get data into the Honeycode. <laughs> there's no way to get data out of the Honeycode. And these APIs they gave you are pretty much very simple uh, and very limited. So I actually don't know who Honeycode is for, but uh, that's the situation at this moment. I thought it was Honeycomb, like a playoff of Honeycomb. Maybe, it's, maybe I'm being naive, but I didn't get the whole woman thing at all. So I'm like, oh, that's sort of lame, but lame for different reasons. 
lame that I that, that was the answer that I came to, or that the no, I mean, I, it's, I thought it was. I thought the name is terrible, and so yeah. I was. I thought it was a playoff honeycomb. Like that's a terrible name. Yeah, there's so many yeah. terrible parts of this name, and in many many different dimensions, depending on how you look at it at this moment. Never mind the name. The product itself is kind of lame too. <laughs> At least it matches for change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little funny to me how ridiculous this product is, considering you know how much noise they made about how they were going to revolutionize, you know, the world of no code, and they were going to do a bunch of stuff. And this is really like every other no code solution that's out there today. Like, I mean, I get that most of them are spreadsheet applications, and most apps for enterprises are spreadsheets. But I mean, like, they could have bought Betty Blocks for less money than they could have, uh, you know, to get this product out the door. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's like Visual Fox Pro from 25 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, It's also pretty sad that a multi-million dollar company, you know, doesn't have the ability to actually take data in or take data out really easily. Uh, But, you know, a friend of the show, Ian McKay, uh, decided to help him out because he's a very nice open source contributor. And so he's released uh, two projects now, a Honeycode AppFlow integration to allow you to integrate it to their IFT competitor which <laughs> seems like that'd be an out-of-the-box feature. And then uh, the second one he did was a Honeycode export to let you export data out of Honeycode. Uh, so if you are really desperate to use a solution and you want to go use uh, Ian's tools, which are great, uh, those are available to you very quickly to help you get started. Uh, but you know they are all supposed to be things that Amazon's going to deliver into Honeycode at some point in the future. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shell this one for about 18 months and come back when they have a 1.0 product. Yeah, I went and actually like played with it the other day and it was amazing how disconnected it was. Like at first when once I like made a secondary login for it because it's not actually tied to your AWS login, I thought like I was moved to a different product or like, you know, a different website completely and thought I was like signing up for a new product because it's so disconnected from everything altogether. I kinda of wonder what kind of apps they imagine you could build with a tool like this. I mean by by the time you run through the tutorial and you do a to do list there's not much left. <laughs> is that is that a comment on no code in general, or is that a comment on enterprise apps? I don't know. Well, <laughs> I think no code in general. I mean, well, if you look at things like Scratch from MIT and things like that, those and those are no code apps, but they they at least they're visual representations of code. I mean, at the end of the day, right? The the biggest thing in most enterprise apps is it's forms and workflows, uh, and you know, a table maybe is available too. So I mean, those are really the three core features of any no code solution, in my opinion, is is a form a workflow to drive that form through the process and then the ability to save the data output of the form. Um, but, you know, it just it feels way too early. Like they, I mean, I know they like to get MVPs out there. They like to get feedback really quickly. I just, I don't know who the customer is. I don't know, you know, they're not going to get people from like Betty Blocks or other solutions for no code into this, you know, because it doesn't have the same features those products even have. So who are they really trying to sell with this right now? I got no idea. I just, just like when it was announced, I'm just staring at it with like this, the sideways head, you know, confused dog look on my face because I still don't understand any point to any of this. Yeah. Well, you can no code your code solution in Honeycode. So it's, it's yeah. turtles all the way down. Yeah. I'm the well, guy who will spend like six hours, you know, coding something up and only to have someone show me up by putting it in Excel in five minutes, getting the same result. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, and speaking of that Java code um, that you write for that kind of thing, you know, the AWS Code Guru is now generally available to help tell us that that code's not very good, too. So <laughs> just okay. so you know, the, after six months of beta, uh, it is now generally available. Uh, of course, the two capabilities of Code Guru we talked about here on the show in the past are the ability to fix your Java code uh, with bad patterns, as well as identify performance issues inside of your code uh, that are potentially expensive. Uh, Code Guru Profiler is the app uh, ingestion tool, and then the uh, Code Guru Code Reviewer is the code piece of it. As part of the GA release, they're announcing a couple of new features as well for you guys. Uh, the Code Guru Reviewer gets you uh, GitHub Enterprise support now, which uh, was a big blocker for most enterprises to actually use this tool that's, that's made for them. Uh, there are also some new types of recommendations to solve defects and improve your code. For example, checking input validations uh, to allow you to avoid issues that can compromise security and performance and looking for multiple copies of code that do the same thing. And then in the Code Guru Profiler, uh, they have anomaly detection now. They now support Lambda functions. Uh, they give you a cost of the issue in terms of CPU impact. Uh, they have a color my code feature. Uh, welcome to every IDE. And then a CloudWatch metrics and alerting capability to uh, help tie that all together into a very nice, simple thing. Uh, I was a little surprised they didn't actually announce a new language uh, or, you know, out beta of a new language like Python or something. Uh, but uh, so we're still, it only supports Java. And if you're using Java applications, then you're going to be really happy. And if you're not, then this is not the tool for you. Go elsewhere. 
So you can take all that savings you get in improving the performance of your code and spend it when you analyze your code line by line in code Google. Excellent. Multiple times for every single commit. <laughs> well, they did fix the commit issue, which was nice. Uh, a couple of weeks back, they announced that they had changed. So you're only paying for the changing lines of code in a, in a pull request versus all of the code in the pull request, which is nice. Um, so that that is a little bit better now on the pricing side, but still, you know, it's a really anti-pattern, and we talked about that here on the show too, but you know, selling you know, analysis by loans of code makes you not want to write lines of code, which I think is a bad choice in some cases. Or, you know, what, you know, fixing the same typo over and over and over again on 16,000 commits, as I am wont to do, it's also going to get kind of expensive. Well, uh, when you get those commits now, if you're using Amazon Code Commit, you can also uh, use Emoji now to react to those comments. Uh, apparently, they are now supporting uh, <laughs> you know, a feature that does not translate well to a podcast, unfortunately. So you're going to have to bear with me here as I talk to you about emojis <laughs> in a non-visual format. Uh, but Code Commit supports emoji reactions to comments on pull requests and the commits. Uh, they only support uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, smiley face, heart, and ship it, which really disappoints me because my comments would have been poop, roll eyes, meh, swearing, clown face, uh, which is how I typically comment my code. And uh, developers apparently at Amazon use comments to give feedback on code all the time, and emojis are a great way to simply say thumbs up and good to you. Uh, my first PFR was already filed on this, which is that I'd like support for all the emojis because that <laughs> just makes me mad. Uh, and this is now available to you if you're using code commit, uh, which I'm not. So I guess I don't really need that PFR, but I, mean, I do want them. Give me all the emojis. Yeah, if you can't use the poop emoji, I mean, come on, what kind of feedback are you giving here? Apparently, thumbs down feedback. The feature that I really like is uh, Giphy support. So, you know, throw a nice GIF on there on somebody's code or, you know, on the PR review that you're doing for someone. It's always a fun one. But I guess that might be the next step of this one once we get past emojis is getting all the GIF support. What is what is Get, uh, GitHub support? Do they support emojis and lots of emojis? I don't. I, I mean, I, I I feel like I've missed out on my career that I had not already tried this. <laughs> but now now that I know it's a capability, I'm going to try it everywhere. Uh, but you know, what does anyone know what the emoji support is on on GitHub? There's like six of them or like eight of them. I know at least on like GitHub issues. Um, I mean, thumbs up, thumbs down. I know are the main ones I use. Um, I'm trying to remember what else there are. Uh, smiley face. Hooray, Confuse, Heart, Rocket, and Eyes. So not a very large, not a very wide selection there either. Jonathan, uh, are you just writing poop emojis somewhere? No, he's muted and not here. <laughs> That's why he's so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. He's just adding it to the, you know, the podcast feedback. He's going to like put his, his own comments in later on without telling anyone. No, he, he, he could. He doesn't yeah. typically do that, though. I could do that. I, I have, would, be the, would not be the first time. <laughs> It seems weird that I mean, why why not just I assume it's just so you can like total up the number of poop emojis that somebody voted for you or whatever. I mean how why not just put it in the comments? I mean how many reviewers are you gonna have review the code? Like is it really worth supporting twenty different emojis independently when you could just put it in the put it in the comment line? Seems like a I, I was I was bored one day feature. It just tells me that all the principal engineers at Amazon are too busy, you know, to really write proper comments into their code reviews. They're just like, Yeah, it's good, plus one. Yeah. <laughs> The thumbs up and thumbs down for GitHub issues make sense because like you can actually sort by them, which I thought was an interesting feature. So you can see this feature or this issue has 20 thumbs up versus this one that has two really quickly by sorting, which was kind of a nice thing. But yeah. Oh, wow. So so like at the end of the year, we can get all, all the developers showing their GitHub commit histories and we can see how much foolish their commits were. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Yeah, so back in the day when, you know, working at a, a previous company, trying to encourage, you know, proper code reviews and code hygiene uh, in the pipeline, we actually built, uh, we reported uh, basically on thumbs up and plus one. And so we, we, told, we instructed teams that when they're doing reviews, they had to use one of those two emojis because their review score was calculated based on, on those being in the review comments. Oh, so interesting. By by you know by team we had a this this percentage of reviews for commits or what I forget the exact metrics but so yeah this goes you know emojis for reviews goes back a long time there should be a bug emoji well then they support the bug emoji <laughs> it's ob obvious obvious missing one yeah yeah the, I I definitely think the the poop one should be there too <laughs> there's lots of time where that's why I want to comment on all code. All right. Well, uh, Amazon uh, at their government public sector virtual summit last week announced the new 
Aerospace and Satellite Solutions Business Unit. And if you are playing at home, friends, that means that uh, this is ass. <laughs> that stands for ass. <laughs> this is AWS ass. <laughs> the Aerospace Satellite Solutions Business Unit uh, will work with government and private sector customers to assist with projects such as satellite launches uh, and is now available out there. Of course, they released the ground station at reInvent a couple of years ago or at, at one of Reinforce or something. Uh, one of the many conferences that I attend. But uh, that allowed you to basically communicate with satellites when they cross overhead. And so this is definitely an expansion of some of those capabilities. Uh, the, the Amazon closely aligns uh, Amazon's initiative, including Project Cooper, which is an initiative which aims to put 3,200 satellites into low Earth orbit. And so this might be a back end solution to help support those. Uh, and, you know, I'm super excited for snow cones in space maybe someday in the future. So there we go. Yeah, we should get our predictions in now for when the first extraterrestrial Amazon data center will be deployed. Even if it's just even if it's just in orbit, it's going to happen. Oh yeah, it's, it's a good point. Edge computing at the yeah. edge of space. There you go. Is, is it really cloud computing if the computing is up in literally the clouds? Then mm. Mm. Oh. oh, maybe maybe that's what Google's going to do with those loom balloons. They're going to add Google compute to it. <laughs> It'll just be the global <laughs> cloud. So there's something very dystopian about those balloons just hanging over places. <laughs> yeah, it's a little a little interesting. Oh, just uh, wait till the armed robots are launched out of them. Then it'll get really disappointing. <laughs> you know they're in there. The uh, interesting that they did put uh, appointed retired Air Force Major General Clint Crozier, the former director of Space Force planning at the U.S. Space Force, to lead the unit, uh, which is sort of ironic timing considering Netflix has a uh, Space Force <laughs> television show which has a major general who's in charge of it, <laughs> played by Steve Carroll. I was like, huh, that's weird. I wonder if this person was in that role. <laughs> it's right. immediately it came to mind. Yeah. I heard there's going to be a trademark war over that because Netflix launched first. <laughs> oh. I don't first know how launch. that would... I mean, the people who enforce trademark, though, is the government, so I don't know how that's going to work out. Yeah, but... Well. <laughs> uh, well, I believe it was uh, two years ago, or maybe a year ago, that Ryan and I were sitting inside of Google Next Auditorium watching a keynote by Thomas Curian. So it must have been a year ago. Uh, and they demoed this magic on stage, which was that they took a running application on Java and they converted it to a container uh, and made it work on Kubernetes. It was all magic to us. And Amazon apparently was impressed with that magic and has now copied it with a new Amazon Web Services app to container command line tool that helps you containerize existing applications that are running on premises in EC2 or in other clouds without needing any code changes. Uh, app2 container discovers applications running a server, identifies their dependencies, and generates relevant artifacts for seamless deployments to either ECS or EKS. Uh, it also provides integrations with Amazon Code Build and Amazon Code Deploy to enable a repeatable way to build and deploy those containerized apps once you've done the conversion. Uh, there are several artifacts generated by the app2 container tool, including the application files and folders, uh, generated Docker files, container images into Amazon ECR, ECS task definitions, and Kubernetes deployment YAMLs, as well as the cloud formation to make it all happen. Uh, it works today with ASP.NET uh, 3.5 and above, and uh, JBoss uh, Java applications, Tomcat, and generic Java apps such as Sprint Boot, WebSphere, and WebLogic, and your Java family. Uh, it does not support anything but those two yet, so again, uh, you'll have to wait if you're using something more interesting like Golang uh, for that to get converted to containers to do in the future. Or maybe it's just easier to do those and you don't need this help. I don't know. Uh, this is offered to you for free, and uh, you only pay for the usage of the services generated by the application, so do watch your bills. I think this is the only way you're going to drag some, you know, teams into containerized application development is by just making an easy button that just does it for them. I'm happy to see that, you know, you know, Amazon is solving some of my biggest woes that I have in my day job. It's pretty funny. Yeah, I was all excited for this. And then I went and I booted it up, you know, with a PHP app and went to install it and then as after I installed it I then ran the fine print which literally says jbot or java and .net and then I was very sad so I'm really hoping that they expand this to other other languages and tools because you know it would be very useful for me I sit in front of customers and they're like we want to do this and we want to go to containers and then you sit down with them and they're like oh we got to figure out all the dependencies and everything else along those lines of everything that we need yeah, no, we're just going to migrate as is. So having something that will help us with that will be, is, we'll be immensely grateful. Yeah, so it's like we lost the tribal knowledge. We, we can't figure this out ourselves. Do it for us. Which is a lot of enterprises out there in the world. So it's, yep. it's good to see there's an option. Uh, but I, I definitely think, you know, just like when you take a, 
a Word document and you convert it to a web page, that the, the HTML that that generates is not so pretty. Uh, I suspect that there's uh, some <laughs> fluff that's going to be in these files that you're not going to really want to want long term. But it's it's a good starting place, and hopefully that helps get you onto the containerization, and then you can start modernizing your applications in a much faster way. On the other hand, I mean, as well as helping you move these to containers, it also gives you lists of dependencies. So if you did lose that intellectual property and you've got this random app running on the server for 15 years, you can, you can have it discover uh, what it needs to run. So maybe it's it's useful in itself as a, a discovery tool. Well, and and the deployment automation. Don't forget that. Like it's it already, you know, do, does the Kubernetes YAML, the cloud formation. So these are it's a huge head start for anyone who's sort of new to that area as well. You know, maybe they replace you know the container with an EC2 instance, and they make some minor modifications depending on how it's set up. But um, I think it will help a lot of people, or at least give them an example they can follow. Yeah, it's really just like the starting point. Like. I always joke with people, it's like, you know, you got to take, you know, that old Microsoft front page. You never want to look underneath the hood to see how it was made, but it worked. And, you know, and then from there, you're like, oh, I actually want to develop something from there. So, like, I feel like this is going to be the same type of thing. Cool. We got it there. We can kind of see. We can play around with it. Once it's there, make sure it all works. And then, oh, let's do it right now. I haven't heard that in a long time, that technology uh, front page. That's been, that took me way back (laughs) to my Dreamweaver days, (laughs) which is the other and Cold Fusion and all these other really defunct web apps. Yeah, you, you thought Word made bad HTML documents. You should have seen those guys. <laughs> oh, I know. I, I did a lot of Dreamweaver development at one point in my career. So. How does Hello World end it up was... being 64K long? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Microsoft still beat them with Word. Hello World would be you know 120 kilobytes. But <laughs> it's, uh... Well, it was your Microsoft Word HTML document that sparked that memory. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone. Jonathan here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the cloud consulting gurus at Foghorn for helping make the cloud pod possible. These folks truly get it. Cloud consulting experts since 2008, they are premier tier partners with AWS, Google Cloud Platform Silver, and Microsoft Azure partners. From multi-cloud to containers to moving full production workloads to the cloud under the tightest compliance, Foghorn's team of full stack cloud engineers have been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt, and are ready to share their experience with you. If you're in the market for some talent to supplement your team, visit www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. Foghorn, the promise of cloud delivered. Well, the other uh, big challenge, uh, if you're dealing with <laughs> legacy applications, of course, is that Microsoft has deprecated .NET <laughs> framework. Uh, so 4.8.NET uh, framework is now the last major version released uh, and Microsoft has stated it will only receive bug reliability and security fixes uh, for the next foreseeable future. And your path forward, of course, is moving to .NET Core. Uh, .NET Core is great if you don't have a UI <laughs> or a bunch of other things that, that aren't included in .NET Core today. Uh, and yeah, while they are fixing those things with Mono and a bunch of other things to bring that capability to .NET Core, it's a bit premature to kill it. I don't exactly understand why Microsoft is doing it quite as fast other than to force the industry. But uh, my, AWS has decided to help you with this problem. And so... To stay current of .NET, you need to take Portrait Application.NET Core. Uh, that's several advantages of this, including being able to run it on Linux OSS software, uh, improved application scalability and performance, and reducing your licensing spend. Uh, although porting can entail significant manual efforts, some of which is undifferentiated, such as references to project dependencies via NuGet, in addition to long, long lists of compile errors and warnings, and overall can be a challenging and a deterrent for many customers with large portfolios of .NET apps to move to .NET Core. And so Amazon is here to help solve all those problems for you. Uh, with a new porting assistant for .NET, which is a new tool that helps customers analyze and port their .NET framework applications to .NET Core running on Linux. The porting assistant for .NET assesses both the application source code and the full tree of public API and NuGet package dependencies to identify those incompatible with .NET Core, and gives guidance to developers to, com- to find compatible replacements when available. Uh, the suggestion engine for the API and package replacements is designed to improve over time as the assistants learn more about the usage patterns and frequency of missing packages and APIs, so it gets real-time feedback from machine learning. And this is all available to you in the AWS console, as well as the tools free to use and available to you today. They're only deprecating this now so that in 25 years, they can finally get rid of that last .NET Framework app, because that's how slow this sector of the industry works for some of these changes. Like, I still see requests on our internal servers for earlier versions of .NET Framework, because there's just a lot of code that's just set up for that and will never be moved. Feels like uh, Microsoft, or sorry, AWS is putting a lot of time and effort for the Windows market. And I know that 
they released a couple of new programs to help people get people onto AWS to migrate their Windows apps or transform them or anything along those lines and get them into AWS. Um, and with there's a couple programs out there and money that you can get from Amazon for all of it. And I feel like this is just another another way that they're trying to do it is really trying to make sure that they take the market, the Windows market away from Azure and Microsoft and into their own cloud. And I think it speaks to the maturity of their customers. Like these are the, the issues that their current customers are coming to them with or, or maybe prospective customers even. And, you know, so this is the type of solution they're building for that area of the business, which is different from, you know, say five, 10 years ago when you were working with smaller agile startups who didn't have as much legacy code. So do you think we have a problem with SDLC where we actually need to start addressing things like end of life for the components of software? Because right now, you know, SDLC ends at, well, production, basically. Maybe have some bug fixes that go back around and testing and redeployments, but but end of life for for components is rarely something I've ever seen considered. So, yeah, it's usually by force, right? There's some other forcing function, either a, a deprecation of your framework, or you know, or some some other dependency that is no longer supported or available. Was usually what causes that sunset or that deprecation. So yeah, you're right. This would be this is a huge thing that is completely missing from the software defined life cycle today. I mean, I think in some agile shops, like this is something you tackle in refactoring sprints, uh, you know, taking a look at dependencies and deprecations of things and patching, you know, open SSL and those type of things. But um, I, I agree with you. I think for the majority of companies, this is not something that's a very strong area of investment yet. And it needs to become probably more so with Docker, especially because, you know, containers bit rot over time and you need to keep them updated. And that also means keeping these dependencies updated. There's um, a tool that's integrated in with GitHub. And I don't remember the name of it. I'll try to find it. And I guess you can add it to the show notes. But essentially, it goes through your dependencies that you have in your app um, and will automatically trigger PRs in your repo for like new versions of stuff. And like, so think like Ruby Gems or, you know, um, Python. Uh, libraries that you're using or anything along those lines it will automatically detect those and then automatically increment those versions in there and then do a pr um, and i've seen a couple of places that have it so essentially github and the automated system is automatically trying to keep all those dependencies as up to date and you'll trigger them earlier versus normally i feel like what it is is someone's like oh i want this feature or oh there's a security bug that's not fixed in our version that some security department or some code sc- scanning tool or something like that is found. And now all of a sudden we have to jump, you know, a major revision of a tool. And now it's a 10, it's 10 things we have to change versus always keeping it up to date. So, you know, th- there are things in the industry that are trying to help people keep their dependencies updated, at least. That sounds like a, a future cool tool segment. That's would be pretty cool. Well, if you, uh, are spending a lot of money on Amazon Outposts. Uh, you are now have the ability to spend even more money with the ability to round run Amazon RDS DB instances on top of those Outposts. Uh, you know, Outposts came out, of course, last year and is the ability to run EC2 compute type capacity in your data center. Uh, now with the support for RDS, uh, you can now run your MySQL and Postgres workloads uh, with plans to add other databases in the future. Uh, the same RDS features are used in the cloud, including backups to Amazon S3, built-in encryption at rest and in transit, and many more capabilities are available to you today. As I mentioned, it is a bit expensive because you do pay a management fee for every managed RDS instance on top of your outpost fee, uh, which is anywhere from uh, about seven tenths of a se- or seven cents to five dollars and forty-seven cents an hour, depending on the size. Uh, which roughly racks out to fifty-five dollars to four thousand dollars, depending on how big that instance is, uh, which is quite a bit. So do keep that in mind if you are running RDS. Uh, but if you're already paying all that money for outposts, these are probably just rounding errors. I just like the idea of the outpost that I expect you to have installed in your garage anytime now, Justin, that I'll be able to launch this mega-sized RDS database just so that I can hear that pitch change, just just as it cranks over a little bit higher, the fans turn on. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be fun. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I could afford to put one in my garage, but uh, you know, if Amazon wanted to send me one for free to play with, I would do it. <laughs> and a credit for my pg e bill, too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, moving on to Azure, uh, we mentioned at the DockerCon that they were going to be integrating uh, Docker Desktop with Azure Container and Services, and they have now released the first version of that with the Docker Desktop integration for Azure. Uh, the Edge release of the Docker Desktop provides integration between Docker and Microsoft Azure that enables you to use native Docker commands to run your applications as serverless containers with the Azure Container instance. Uh, you can leverage Docker uh, for a single image, or you can use Docker Compose to spin up a set of systems. 
Uh, combined with the Visual Studio Code Docker extension, you can integrate experience to uh, have an integrated experience to start, stop, and manage your containers, images, contexts, and more. And if you're using the Edge release of the Docker desktop, since this, you know, by the start, since the start of this podcast, you are only nine revisions behind. What's current? <laughs> Yeah, I, I tried that for a, like a week, and I was updating Docker every other day, and I said, no, this is terrible. Yeah, I spent more time approving. Yes, yes, install it. Yes, install it. The Azure Load Balancer Insights are now available for allowing you to monitor networks. Uh, the Azure Load Balancer customers now have instant access to a package solution for health monitoring and configuration analysis. Uh, built as part of the Azure Monitor for Networks, customers can have now a topological map for all their load balancer configurations and health dashboards with their standard load balancer. Uh, through this, you have a window into the health and configuration of your networks, enabling rapid fault localization and informed design decisions. Uh, you can access this through an Insights Blade of each load balancer resource and Azure Monitor for Networks, a central hub that provides access to health and connectivity monitoring for your network resources. Uh, so this is basically load balancer insights, <laughs> which they're stealing the, the Amazon naming for. That's really great. Appreciate that. And is it really truly like insights? Is it detecting anomalies? Is it in, in outside, you know, stuff that's outside of normal or, or trends? Or is it just metrics and visibility into configuration? So like, it does give I read you some, through, I wasn't sure. It, it does give you some data, like, you know, health probe status and snack connection counts and send counts, et cetera, to the load balancer. It does give you some stats. It tells you where traffic's coming from around the globe, as well as flows for inbound and outbound data. But uh, it doesn't tell me, like, what's broken, I don't think. Yeah, I, I I looked through it and I just didn't see a lot of the features that I'd expect, um, you know, and I wasn't sure which way they were going. You know, like, is this going to, you know, is this a tuning configuration that's going to predict my load, or is this it's broken and I need the stats to go figure out how it's broken? It, it seems to be sort of missing on both sides. Mm -hmm. Well, both on on both AWS and on Azure uh, for load balancers, I like a really big red box that pops up when your container's dying, which is why you're getting 500 errors. Because <laughs> 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 the amount of time I spent trying to troubleshoot a load balancer just to find out that the container is flapping like crazy in the back end that would have been nice to be fronted to my load balancer, would, it's too often. And that well, that's what it kind of looks like. I mean, I only I skimmed the the document, and it sounds like they're trying to get there. So like. You'll see your front end that you're that it's making the connections to, and then in theory kind of map your back end resources a little bit out, so you could see that you know potentially things are you know these ones in this you know availability zone are down, and maybe you have some sort of issue there. So they're like they're trying to visualize it. I don't think they're dynamically adjusting traffic flow or anything like that, which would be a nice thing to eventually have. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think there's potential, but I like to see a little bit more. Uh, Real-time follow-up from Matt Cohn. Uh, apparently, the GitHub tool is called Dependabot. <laughs> uh, so we'll put a link to that in the show notes. But Dependabot apparently is a different website that is now going to be integrated into GitHub. So I don't know if that's an acquisition of some kind or some spinoff they were trying to do, and they decided to bring it back into the mothership when Microsoft bought them. But uh, this is the automated dependency updates feature we talked about a little earlier. Uh, and the last Azure announcement is uh, you can now dis build, distribute, and deploy application updates to Azure Virtual Machine scale sets automatically. Uh, automatic image-based upgrades for custom images provides you the ability to deploy new versions of VM images to your virtual machine scale set, which is the auto-scaling group for those who are not familiar with Azure. The automatic image upgrade natively integrates with shared image gallery, providing the scalable distribution of VM images with the ease and safety of orchestrated infrastructure updates to offer an end-to-end -end solution from image publishing to workload deployment, or as I like to call it, the automatic break production system. <laughs> you know, I remember when we first started the podcast, the, the features released by Azure were like six months behind or more. So, I mean, the AWS only just released this exact same thing two or three weeks ago. So the, they're simply catching up on at least some of these fairly critical things. EC2 Image Builder was released in December at reInvent. So yeah, it's not that far along, you know, about six months. But yeah, it's still faster than it was when we started the show. Well, no, this, this is like the, the auto-scaling, the, the rolling... Um, oh, yeah, the rolling auto -scaling group, auto -scaling yeah. Groups, yeah. yeah. It's getting closer. Getting closer. Very close. Still, still way apart, but getting close. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if maybe this is me sort of not understanding this completely because I'm not an Azure person, but like it sounds like this is actually like updating the images, you know, from the image gallery and then kind of going through it. So is it updating the images in the image gallery and producing a new one when there's a when there's an update? And then orchestrating the release of it for you automatically? Or is it just like, hey, we have it and then they are tying it into the other system? So, I, yeah, I see this as an updating of your running if you have an auto-scaling group or a cluster of machines. And so if there's a new AMI, it's going to 
it's going to allow you to update those in a rolling fashion. I don't know if it's the library for se. Moving on to Google. Uh, Google is introducing committed use discounts for Cloud SQL, which reward your steady state, predictable usage in a way that's easy to use and accommodate changes in your database environment. The Cloud SQL committed use discount gives you a 25% discount off of on-demand pricing for a one-year commitment and a 52% discount off of on-demand pricing for a three-year uh, three commitment. Uh, the committed use discounts are flexible, including no upfront payments are required, available to be shared between MySQL, PostgreSQL, and SQL Server instances, and fully transferable between machine sizes. Come on, guys, discounts. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I was blown away when I recently found out that they, uh, which wasn't that long ago, which is funny, that they automatically discount your your static workloads. I just think that's a fantastic idea, and it's really nice in the customers. When you basically cross that threshold about halfway through the month where all of a sudden you get a discount because it's been running all month. Yeah. Yeah. Really nice. And this has been there for with GCP. I remember I went to, like, a, they did, like, a one-day conference in San Francisco, and they brought up the steady state discounts and I was like, wait, really? And I'm surprised that no one else has done that or Google doesn't make a much larger deal with the fact that, look, even just using us and that we don't, and as long as you have steady state, like we'll just give you the discount, you know, you unlike everywhere else where they have, you know, the on-demand price. And if, even if you have two running at all times and you never, you know, buy the savings plan or anything along those lines or buy the RI, then you then you don't get that saving so it's really nice that you know google just does that for you here's 25 percent off because we know what you're going to use i mean on the on you know having talked to google salespeople recently that they bring it up a lot <laughs> um <laughs> okay. i'd also if i was amazon or asia i would argue and say well they're charging you a higher price versus giving you the lower price all month long uh so they're actually they're taking advantage of an auto scaling group by so charging you more money for not committed you or you know, not for sustained usage so there's arguments both sides of it, but I agree with you. I think it's a nice option, <laughs> especially for teams that don't understand RIs and don't understand sustained use and their auto scaling needs. And so it's it's a nice way to get kind of some break. Uh, but you know, it, in some ways, it's a tax on being auto scaling and not having yourself running as much. If you look at it from that perspective, it's better to run things for the full month, which is a bit of an anti pattern. Yeah, but I see the RI markets and the you know in in both Amazon and now savings plans in both Amazon and Azure as not really. Like we're trying to give you the biggest discount. What that's trying to do is get you to commit to longer term. Mm -hmm. Well, that's you that's know, all spend. about committing, committed revenue because the Wall Street likes to know yeah. what your revenue is going to be, uh, so you can predict it and be somewhat accurate in your prediction. So the discount, you know, RIs and committed use and all that kind of gives them that predictability, whereas the you know on-demand pricing doesn't give them that flexibility. They don't know what's going to happen. And so, I'm, like I said, I think in Google's case, they're kind of giving you a tax because they have to they have to have capacity available for you that you're not committing to long term. And so, you know, but if you're using it for more than a month, we can now commit your money to the month. And so we give you a discount. And so that's how I see it. But yeah, you know, there's probably more nuances to it. I don't understand cloud billing at that level, but that's kind of how I think of it when I see it. I don't think anyone understands cloud billing. I mean, it's so complicated and no one really takes a really deep dive into it until some CFO comes to you and says, hey, our bill is, you know, X thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. What happened? And then people finally get around and actually, you know, will take a look and see, oh, we could be using Spot for this workload or, you know, we really should buy our eyes and stuff like that. Like until somebody really pushes down on the engineers and developments and DevOps teams, like no one really fully starts to utilize all those things at day one. Mm -hmm. mm. I think cloud spread is kind of like it's kind of like the difference between using a credit card to buy something and using cash. Because if it's cash, you see it going out, you spend it, and, and your wallet gets lighter every, every time. With a credit card, you know, it's just a magical, you swipe the card, and it's sort of intangible in a way. I think cloud just makes it too easy to spend money without knowing what what you're spending until it's too late. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, my experience with before, you know, utilizing cloud hyperscalers was that you just ended up with these large, overcommitted workloads, and then you had really no idea what what costs were in that environment like other than renewal time and what it was going to take to replace it all you had no visibility mm. so I, I i do it is really easy to spend money so i do hear that point but i also think there's the flip side of this where it's really easy to see how your money is spent yeah that's that's fair so i, I assume they're only giving us discounts on the compute side of this because you get the same discount for mysql and sql server so i wonder if uh, there's still more room for negotiation when it comes to long-term sql licensing and stuff like that Hmm, possibly. Yeah, it's actually they didn't, so they're taking margin on MySQL and Postgres because they're charging you the same. Yeah. You never know. 
All right. Well, uh, Google has also announced a new image, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting because uh, we're only a week away from Google Next, and uh, I assume that they would uh, you know, potentially save this one, but they didn't. So the first one is uh, machine learning and HPC applications can never get too much compute performance at a good price. And so the new compute engine A2 VMs are the first NVIDIA Ampere A100 GPUs available to you in the cloud, the accelerator-optimized family. Of compute. The A2 supports up to 16 GPUs on a single VM. Uh, the A2 VMs are the first of their kind and available in a private alpha today. So they're the first if you're an alpha, but uh, if you're a normal person, you cannot get these instances. Uh, these A2 instances support several configurations from one GPU with 12 vCPUs and 85 gigs of RAM, all the way up to that 16 gigabit GP or 16 GPU, 96 vCPUs, and 1.3 terabytes of RAM. Uh, and these support up to 100, ter 100 gigabits per second of bandwidth and up to 3 terabytes of local SSD disk. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff here that the GPU architecture of the Ampere, uh, A2 Ampere supports. Uh, things like TensorFloat 32, uh, hand 16-bit math capabilities, uh, inference uh, workload support, as well as a new sparse Tensor Core instruction set, allowing you to get much, much faster performance on all of the big machine learning and AI capabilities that you may need of a box of this kind, which is not me. Uh, but I'm sure someone out there is super excited about this capability. I was going to say, this is going to make my Minecraft server scream. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Your Bitcoin mining will go faster, yeah. too. It's <laughs> probably the better use case than probably. Minecraft. Although they just say 16-bit math capabilities are enhanced. There you go. I wish I had a use case and was smart enough to figure out how to leverage, you know, write my own machine learning mod, uh, you know, models or anything along those lines to actually use something like this. Just, I always see them, I'm like, Wow, that's impressive. I have no use case for it, but I really want to figure out how to use this at one yeah. point. I, I, that's, that's my boat. <laughs> it's like, this sounds really cool, and I really like to use this, but I don't have a use case for this at all. Uh, but you know, if I did, I would be super pumped. Yeah, I kind of learn on demand. Like it's Until there's a project that comes along that needs me to learn something, I, I either don't have the time to do it, or I, just, I find it much more difficult to learn out of context in a way. So yeah, if anyone's got a really good idea for a a machine machine learning project to kind of get you started, then uh, let me know because I'd love to have a play with this stuff with, with a real purpose in mind. Yeah. I have the same problem on learning programming languages like, like Hello World examples and, you know, list sort of, you know, silly things make no sense to me. And I'm like, I don't, I don't rock it. But as soon as I put it into my context of how I need to solve my problem, I can figure it out pretty quickly and, and pick up a language. Well, the uh, last announcement is a big win for uh, Google. Uh, they have signed Deutsche Bank uh, to form a, uh, a partnership to form a strategic global multi-year partnership to drive a fundamental transformation of the banking world for Deutsche Bank. Uh, they have agreed to join for forces not only for the cloud, but also to handle strategic initiatives together. And so they're apparently going to be producing some financial products uh, for other clients of Google together, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the contract, uh, they have set a, signed a letter of intent, but the contract is not quite signed yet. Uh, there's a couple of quotes here from uh, our friends over at Google, Sundar Pichai. For more than 150 years, Deutsche Bank has been an industry pioneer with a strong record of innovation in the financial services sector. Uh, we're excited about our strategic partnership and the opportunity for Google Cloud to be helpful to Deutsche Bank and its clients as they grow their business and shape the future of the financial services industry. Uh, and then CEO uh, Christian Seiwig of Deutsche Bank said, the partnership with Google Cloud will be an important driver of our strategic transformation. It demonstrates our determination to invest in our technology as our future is strongly linked to successful digitalization. It is as much of a revenue story as it is about costs, uh, which is really interesting. So a couple things here. They did uh, open this up for bidding in February to both AWS, Azure, and Google. Uh, and apparently five years ago, they actually signed a deal with HP to adopt the Helion private cloud from HP, which then they killed a year later, uh, leaving Deutsche Bank out in the cold. Uh, so this is a much more interesting development from the fact that they've tried to go cloud a couple times and failed. Uh, and now they think Google's the way to get there. Right. So they go with the only other cloud that also likes killing things on a, on a regular basis. That's <laughs> two for two. <laughs> Bold move. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to lightning round. So without Peter, uh, Jonathan has volunteered to read the words. <laughs> and uh, we will let Matt score us because Matt uh, is a neutral third party. And so we didn't have time to write up uh, lightning round uh, Saturday Night Live update version. So we'll just do it this way. All right. Azure Pipelines now supports Linux slash ARM64. And it only costs you an arm and a leg. But I'm going to mark that one down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, J Justin's doing the same thing as me. He's coming for the first yep. one and the last one. Coming out swinging. Durable Functions now supports Python. Which it better be durable because Python is incredibly slow. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Watch out for the snake.
If my function isn't durable, I don't know why I want it. I just don't want it if it's not durable. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud customers can now use their own prefix list to simplify the configuration of security groups and root tables. I should prefix this that I have no idea what this meant, but someone else hopefully does. I actually went in like because I was like, "What is this?" And it, it actually is kind of nice because you can like pretty much group IP addresses. I'm thinking like for a security group into one chunk, and then you can just tell your security group to say, "Allow this group of IPs," and then you can use that across everywhere in your environment. Yeah, this has been a feature request for 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 years to simplify things like this. Like you've got your corporate trusted IPs and just define it once and just refer to it. This is this is this has been on so many people's. This shouldn't have been a lightning round topic, actually. If we'd read it through it, I could have moved it back. Anyway, <laughs> oh, you mean it, should a, it should have been a main topic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now that I know what it is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's such, I mean, it's such a small press release. This should have come with fireworks and everything. That's pretty funny, actually, because I didn't get as far in the show notes as as the lightning round. So, and I didn't understand what it was when I read it the first time. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really understand what it was either. But that is, that is kind of cool. How you've described it to me in a yeah. much more elegant way. As your storage, 200 terabyte block blob size is now in preview. Again, the blob, you can't let the blob get this big. It just, it's its going to end badly. It's just expanding. It's just expanding. I did find the blob on Turner Classic Music by the movies, by the way. And also, they have a, a Turner Classic Movie wine club, so I could get wine from them. 16 bottles of wine for like $80, and then I could watch the blob. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> Quarantine day 9,664. Yeah, <laughs> yep, exactly. Do you watch the movie before drinking the wine, or do you, so you drink, drink the, the wine first? Well, so, they, so the, t the way the, wa the wine club works is that it, you, they pair the wine with a movie, a classic movie, on the, on the TCM network uh, or on streaming or wherever you want to get it from. Uh, and so that way you can enjoy the wine that ties into the movie. And so sometimes it, like, there are wines from some of the actors, like um, Betty White has a wine, apparently. And so there's a Betty uh, White early movie that they recommend to watch to pair with your Betty White wine, uh, for example. So, they're not a sponsor, by the way. If they'd like to sponsor us, I'd yeah. be happy to take their money. But <laughs> <laughs> they can sponsor me with wine, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Does Betty White have a red wine or just a white wine? You know, I, I didn't get that far. <laughs> I, have to, so. I have to look that up now. I like Betty White's yeah. red wine. Okay. Company branding feature is now available on your organization's Azure AD sign-in page. Just showing that even Azure knows that no one wants to admit they use Azure. At least now hackers know who they're hacking when they try to log in. Justin kind of took mine, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. You were first. It's only fair. Amazon Connect allows you to continue engaging with your customer after an agent hangs up. That means that now they'll know that I'm cursing them out in anger as they hung up on me. Those bastards. <laughs> I want to have sentiment analysis for this is the next feature. Amazon Connect gives you sentiment analysis for when you disconnect on a customer and they start swearing, you now know how angry they actually were. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that would be fantastic. I would have so much fun trolling or like mining that data. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there was a, a company I actually interviewed with about seven, eight years ago in Boston that what their whole product was, was voice analysis, real-time voice analysis of people to um, different like hotlines like abuse suicide like anything like that to like help the agent actually engage with them and give them real-time feedback so eh, it's a real thing I, I heard about insurance companies doing uh, basically lie detection for uh, claims over the phone using similar technology scary stuff well not scary creepy maybe Maybe that was uh, seven or eight days ago, not seven or eight years ago. Because oh, after, no, after, after we asked you that question earlier, I assumed that you were. <laughs> <laughs> AWS Code Deploy now enables automated installation and scheduled updates of the Code Deploy agent. Because I love it when my deployment agent automatically updates and that breaks the build. It's fantastic. What's well, even better when the Code Deploy agent gets too old and then no longer can deploy anything. So it's mm, that's good too. Code no do nothing agent. Self-updating tools are pretty handy. Until they break your stuff. <laughs> then they're not so great. Nah. That's what monitoring's for. Yeah. I, I, like the, I like automated, but I want controlled automation. So I tell you when I want to do the automated thing, I just don't want you to go do it automatically without telling me first. That's all. I just like, I like change control, friends. No, nope. lazy developer. Just make it go. Make it do it. And that's why you use no. Gentoo Linux. That's right. <laughs> AWS CodeBuild now supports additional shell environments. I mean, it's just turtles all the way down anyways in the shell world. So, you know, Mac now supports ZSHs. Or I can't use Bash as default on Mac anymore. I have to use something else. Just shells. Ugh. 
Oh, that kind of shells. I thought it was like conches and stuff like that. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, it makes more sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> Age of less hermit build now occupies additional shell environments. So. Well, <laughs> I guess I, I really think this is for Mac users because they were like, all the Mac people just switch over to, to uh, ZSH or whatever, replace Bash. That I, I defaulted back to Bash immediately because I couldn't do it. Um, you know, so I'm assuming they they've all now wanted to write all their automation in in ZSH, and so they need to support different shells. I think it's actually the Windows shell they support. No, it, it's both. Um, it, well, it, it supports Bash shell for Amazon Linux or Ubuntu as well as Command shell now available. So, really, what, really at the end of the day, what happened in Code Build prior is I just had to deal with this because I was trying to build a PHP app. Uh, you had to write all of this code in your basically their funky DSL language because Amazon likes to have a thousand DSLs. That you have to learn and uh, know. Uh, now you can do your code building inside of a shell to do a simple bash script to you know take my PHP files, check them out from the GitHub repo, and zip them, uh, and then send that to S3. That's now much much easier. Or no, actually the new Amazon Artifact service, uh, you know that's now available to do that simply versus the way it was done previously, which is in their fun DSL language. And by fun, you mean not fun. If there wasn't 20 different versions of DSL languages in the AWS world, I wouldn't mind it. <laughs> but because it's like every one of the apps has a different DSL language from documents and SSM to uh, you know, this code build one, et cetera, that's, that's what gets frustrating really quickly. Mm. The worst thing about new shells, though, is you, you know, discarding 30 years of Google history and the stack, stack Overflow and Quora and all these other things. You can no longer Google for your easy answers if you switch shells. That's true. Bad. Bring back the past. Amazon EMR uses real-time capacity insights to provision spot instances to lower cost and interruption. Isn't this what I'm paying Amazon or Spot to do for me? Like, now I have to build my own EMR cluster to figure out spot instance pricing? Ugh. Thanks, but no thanks. Machine learning to do my machine learning. Introducing EC2 Launch V2 to simplify customizing Windows instances. Anything to simplify customizing customizing a Windows instance. Which registry key is it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just wait the ten minutes for it to actually boot up, so you can actually then get the password from the GUI too. <laughs> That's the always fun part. I'm just starting to cry thinking about all my Terraform SQL Server stuff earlier this year. <laughs> Hang on, <laughs> drink. Drink. <laughs> <laughs> If only this had been around four months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, EC2 Image Builder can now produce and distribute encrypted AMIs. I mean, so now everyone can get the joy of learning how awful KMS is across multiple regions and trying to encrypt your data. Fantastic. I'm still shocked that this wasn't just a day one feature, like especially with, you know, the keynote a couple of years ago and wearing a encrypt everything sure you know and any of these services day one need to support encryption oh, i wish they would just default to encryption like tls encryption address everything so that should be default on and then from there you know you can basically change it <laughs> if you don't need encryption but i i don't agree with the opt-in model of encryption what's the real use case though for for encrypting your images i mean I... well if you're putting pi data into the image for some crazy reason or for machine learning you might be putting data sets onto the image so you don't have to pull it down to S of S3 in advance. You know, there's there's some use cases for it. They're not good ones, but they're there. Yeah. But also, like, if you give this image, then that you harden an image centrally, then give it to your you know application teams, and they put then their your you know they run stuff locally on the C drive or on you know slash, with you know, and they are processing stuff locally and storing it or temporarily. Like, you need that base volume to be encrypted. But you can deploy encrypted images from non-encrypted images. Encrypted yeah. instances from non-encrypted yeah. images, though. I don't know. Ah, whatever. Amazon Forecast now supports generating predictions for 10 times more items. There's only one thing I want Forecast to predict, and that is my Amazon bill, and yet it still can't do that. Yep. That is not one of the 10 things. I have to say, I saw this prediction coming. <laughs> but da uh, ba ba uh -huh. ba I'm Trying to pull the win at the very last one. It it's was like, the last one. Every, I knew every it. time. Every I time. Knew it. Every time. All right, Matt. <laughs> As the honorary Peter today, uh, who do you think won this? I'm going to go with Justin. Just overall, like, consistent, you know, good commentary on everything. I have the advantage that I actually read the show notes, unlike my co-hosts. It does, so. does help, yeah. <laughs> that does help. Yeah. Details. Details. Yeah. So I can think about them and they come to me I will give times. you no excuses. Me? I have no excuses. <laughs> 
All right. Well, that is it here on the Week in Cloud. Anything coming up, guys, that you want to talk about? Uh, this episode will come out after Google Next, but uh, that is happening soon. P- uh, anything exciting in the Foghorn world, Matt, you want to share? Peter never tells us exciting things like, you know, you got partner status with Azure or, you know, you're you're now a, a serverless hero or, you know, whatever or a, a, whatever it is for the training thing. Yeah, he doesn't tell us about those things. But if you want to share. Um, we're now a Microsoft. Hold on. Let me get the right Amazon phrasing of it. Um, we're in a we're in a competency related to actually helping people migrate Microsoft workloads to the cloud. Um, that's also how I know that they are doing a big push around it. Um, so helping people migrate, or whether it's you know do a POC, or actually you know take some take an app and do the migration, or even just taking a, an app that's already in the cloud and transforming it. Um, we do are we're able to work with Amazon closely and potentially even get funding for different teams in order to actually get all to get that going. So if you ever need help migrating a Microsoft workload, we are around to help you. Fantastic. Well, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. And, uh, you know, I think I wonder if the strategy is to move as many Windows workloads off uh, to them as possible before Azure makes it free to run Windows on their cloud or something crazy. <laughs> so, so, so it seems like we're heading that direction. We're like, oh, you don't want to move off of .NET 3.8? Well, if you run it on Azure, we'll support that forever. That's that's the play, I think. But anyways, mm-hmm. well, thanks guys for joining us here on this week's episode. Always happy to have you, Matt, uh, and come join us anytime when you have architecture questions around, uh, you know, moving data between two nodes in a cloud. You know, if you can help us out on that. The future would be great. Perfect. I'll come with better answers next time. Then quickly. Awesome. Thanks guys. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. And that is the week in cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag thecloudpod. Or join our Slack channel, go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions.